Uh, good afternoon. We should, uh, we should just get started. It's an extraordinarily uh, privilege and honor to have uh, the eminent photographer Raghu Rai, eminent artist, photographer, and many other superlatives, uh, to have him with us for the Mahindra lecture. Uh, my name is Tarun Khanna, and I'm, my only function here is to introduce um, and clear the decks. But I will just introduce the Mahindra lecture very quickly and then uh, Mr. Rai, and then leave it to him to take it away. Thereafter, I'll moderate a small discussion, if any moderation is necessary, which it may not be. Uh, the Mahindra Lecture is given in honor of the late Harish C. Mahindra, a distinguished alum of Harvard College. Uh, Mr. Mahindra was the founding chairman of Mahindra Eugene Steel Company, a director of what we call m, m in India, and was instrumental in developing the United World College of India, located in Pune. This series, the Mahindra Lecture, is inspired by his passion for education and is an important component in continuing the education understanding of the challenges facing the region, in particular India. A number of eminences have preceded you, Mr. Rai, in this lecture. Most recently, Dr. APJ Abdul Kalam Azad, Abdul Not Kalam, bad. 11th President of India. He gave a lovely lecture called Empowering Billions of People in 2011. Prior to him, Nirupama Rao, Foreign Secretary of India, talked about India's global role. Prior to that, Mr. Chidambaram, who was then the finance minister, titling his talk, The Poor Rich Country, The Challenge of Development, a dichotomy you'll appreciate in your many photographs, I'm sure. And before that, Pranab Mukherjee, Minister of Defense at the time, today, of course, the President of India, talking about India's security perspective in 2006. Uh, I was very keen, personally, to expand our repertoire outside of politics, and so, uh, with the help of the uh, steering committee of the South Asia Institute and a number of eminences who are here with us today, we had a lot of consultation and it was with great pleasure uh, that we were able to invite Mr. Rai and even greater pleasure that you accepted and made your way over here, so we're grateful for that. I'll say a few words about Mr. Rai, even though he needs no introduction. Raghu Rai is a New Delhi-based photographer, born in 1942 in a small village called Jung, which is now a part of Pakistan. It turns out that this is very close to the village that my parents are from. So we were exchanging some words in Punjabi right before this. Um, Rai started photog photography in 1965 at the age of 23. And his photographs are just extraordinary, just extraordinary. For those of you who attended uh, uh, a brief exhibition come discussion come description yesterday, um, I was just completely blown away by the range of images of everyday life, of the physicality, as you put it, of daily life. Uh, in India, uh, of the depictions of divinity across different faiths, and so on and so on. Just mind-blowing. He's photographed Mother Teresa, that's the poster that we chose to advertise his talk, His Holiness the Dalai Lama, the late Indian Prime Minister Indira Gandhi, and so on and so on. His powerful work on the Bhopal gas tragedy won him huge accolades. His work reflects, in a sense, the complexity of India. He's published over 18 books, some of which are outside, those of you who are interested and exhibited pretty much around the world. His work is in the permanent collection at the Bibliothèque Nationale de Paris. In 1972, Rai was awarded the prestigious Padma Shri, one of India's signal civilian honors, the first ever for a photographer for his work on the Bangladeshi refugees of war. Without further ado, I'll ask uh, Mr. Rai to deliver the Mahindra lecture, and then we'll take it from there. Thank you, sir. Well, thank you very much, Jen, for saying such beautiful words. I am not a lecture-giving kind, because they say a photographer's work should speak for itself. Uh, I am not into reading books. But uh, one book which I started reading ever since I picked up my camera. And this book never begins from anywhere, nor does it end anywhere. And this is a book of life, and which is an ongoing affair with life and nature. And my education is pretty much from 
through the camera, through the lens, when I engage myself and get into the complexity of things and I start to explore and I learn and I grow, you know. You know, I like to say something very personal. My father had four sons. The eldest one was highly educated, double MA, LLB, PhD, and done many books on child welfare. So my father thought, hey, at least I've got a good son. The second son, who started doing a government job, you know, in early 50s and 60s, getting a government job was very important in India. So he started doing a government job. Along the way, he thought it wasn't good enough, and he started taking pictures. I was, I was asked to do civil engineering, which I did, being an obedient son. And then <clears throat> I worked with the government for a year, and I got bored. And even I started taking pictures. And my father was horrified. So if people asked him, how many sons do you have? He used to say, he used to say I had four sons. Two have gone photographers. It's like two have gone mad. <laughs> and working for newspapers and magazines, you know, in the country, uh, then, you know, our work started appearing in important newspapers and magazines with the byline. And then my father suddenly found that these sons are doing better. And then one day he decided to have a drink with us, which was something very rare for us. So this is how <laughs> I started my career. You know, like a building is constructed brick by brick, my life is constructed click by click. This aspect is very important to me, you know. And ever since I started taking pictures, this camera has given me the discipline to gather my energies together. I shall say my mind body and spirit come into an alignment of oneness, I can take a concentrated look into the world around me that I focus and explore. Now, this is something I have learned over a period of time, when the relevant and the irrelevant, they separate to merge again. In that moment of resonance, the nuances whisper. The silence takes over, you may lose a heartbeat because the moment captured has taken it away from you. So this is something very closely related to my inner world because with the age, with the time, actually yesterday somebody asked me, you know, the creative expression and the creative energy with the age you know, when you get enough name, people slow down. And you think, you know, you can do it without any much pressure, you know. But let me tell you, even after almost 50 years in photography, I don't have a magic finger. And I have to invest myself 100% each time make myself available to situations, and then they speak to you. You see, in creativity, there are no fixed rules, no fixed parameters of any kind. And sometimes when I speak amongst the photographers, you know, they find it very hard, you know. We have, a ch we have some religious channel called Astha. So they say, are you related to that channel which is very religious and gives those kind of discourses? But my journey has been 
with his now when i say with his blessing i don't call him christ ram or allah i call him supreme energy which has all the magic and power of its own kind you know you know what can we really use useful and healthy world view is to have a very personalized journey and its dividends shall resonate their own kind of echoes because they are born out of your own guts and that's the uniqueness of we the humans you know as nothing is permanent in this world but instinctive response can be far more lasting and shall have universal appeal talking about permanence of it all i am of the belief that buddha lord ram lord krishna christ guru nanak or muhammad they were not gods otherwise they wouldn't have died you know as one of my artist friend said something very unique and beautiful he says you know what is the biggest achievement of man that he invented a god for himself you know in mexico <clears throat> the chaypas they have you know in one of their tribal area a strange tradition what they do is there's a huge shell of a big church and inside you walk inside it's a very smoky place there are groups of people sitting there and they have their own statues of their own gods which they've built or carved themselves so they pray to that god and they ask for good life and good fortune if the god doesn't help them they get angry they break his hand you are no good you know and they wait and they pray and if if their life is not improved or changed they smash him to pieces and they resurrect another one you know so you know there are all kinds you know of expressions which you can't ignore so coming back to our gods these great saints and godly men as we know the, about them lived a very pious and pure life a life of dedication compassion so these pure souls were blessed and charged with that kind of supreme energy or you may call it universal energy and that engulfs us all these god men when they touched any suffering or diseased person the supreme energy worked through them to to heal the disease these gods were also made in the image of human beings in fact they were as mortal as any one of us and now that they are gone they are not going to come back you know because this is the crisis of today's world you know that in the name of christ in the name of allah in the name of ram we have so much of terrorism so much of chaos happening because imagine you know when christ was being crucified he couldn't save himself you know when the biggest jihadi osama bin laden was being killed by the american seals the allah didn't appear anywhere even when the ram temple was being demolished ram was nowhere to be seen so it's really between all of us to understand and sit together and value and pray this is, you know how we can make a difference to this world you know
you know in america christianity and successive presidents have been talking about god bless america it's it's a very nice expression for sure you know when president obama was fighting his first elections the whole world was watching being the superpower today the only superpower the whole world was watching and people all over the world let me tell you at least in our part of the world they had this feeling that this man is like one of us maybe he is going to make a difference to the world and that's why you know he was so victorious because the fact is that today in today's world you know amazingly all those magical experiences all that music that has been created over the centuries all that creative energy is floating around in this space and when people gather together and work for it and they get connected and that's why at least in our culture it's very precious that you must have blessings because no matter how creative you are or how creative is human mind and how educated you might be it comes to a point of saturation where you become static or you start repeating yourself but you connect if you connect with that energy which is floating around in this space it's endless expression and there is no stopping and in fact you know we people from the east we feel that everything comes from somewhere nothing comes from nowhere so everything is ultimately related to a point you know and even in my photography the human energy the human expression the coexistence of various energies is so important to me that i always wait you know for instance even uh, they've changed the picture even this one here you know when i went on top of this house you know and i saw this this couple talking to each other it seemed they were you know romancing or flirting with each other and the city in the background and they were standing and i was watching and taking pictures from a distance and i kept watching i said yes it is interesting but not enough and then comes the breeze and her sari goes flying and touching the man and that's where the magical connection is made you know these are little little things you know which make a lot of difference you know for instance you know this is old delhi you can see the jama masjid in the background and the clouds i was shooting you know from rooftops in the ridge area wondering you know what to do and i had taken lots of pictures but wasn't satisfied and at the end of the day when i decided to leave the place because nothing much was happening you know i was coming down the steps and i see this lady praying now this is eternal india you know and you as an eternal witness though we believe that the purpose of photography is to capture the time we live in and the time we live in is very difficult and chaotic today but the timelessness is something which takes you beyond the time as well you know so and also india is so amazing and because in india you know there are places where you go and you find that you landed in maybe 18th century or 16th century this is very beautiful expression in pakistan also they say jeeve jeeve pakistan which is a term of endearment which sounds very beautiful but who's going to say god bless the universe god bless us all we say we stand in global space it's a global village so when are we going to be connected truthfully and honestly is the question and why i talk about supreme energy coming in and helping us even in this image you know i was standing 
and looking at these sparrows, you know, picking the grains. And I'm not taking a picture because they are looking pretty, but nothing special is happening. And suddenly this black bird comes and lands there. And the sparrows, they leave the space for the big bird to come. So it's between the big bird and the small birds, you know, the fight will always go on. Who claims more space, you know, in this world? Now, you see, these are some of my early photographs. And I took with an ordinary camera, with an ordinary lens. But with a child's sense of wonder that you stand there and you say, oh my God, crisscross of all kinds of traffics, you know, and tongas and push carts and cy cyclists, everybody going in different directions and the patches on the road, you know. I took these early pictures like with a sense of wonder, you know, what it means, but I didn't realize that they were going to become important images, you know. Because at that time, at young age, I had no liability of becoming a photographer, you know. And I had no liability of being creative about anything. So I was doing things from feeling. And everything I did had more expression. And later when I became a professional photographer, it became difficult for me to take good pictures because my head was stuffed. You know, and also the fact in creativity that computer technology is very recent phenomena. With the click of the mouse, you have world's knowledge and philosophy at your disposal. And this computer that God has installed in each one of us is much larger in terms of memory and expression. But the problem is that you cannot delete any memory from this computer. And this heavyweight champion always sits controlling your actions, your way of doing things, you know. In creativity, you have to delete everything or you have to switch off all the memory in order to receive something different and something new. And when I say that the universe holds endless powerful energy, and when you are like a programmed human machine, you are not open and you are not connected to any of those vibrations. So that's where the loss is, you know. You know, uh, in India also we have an organization called SPICMACA which is an organization where they invite musicians, writers, and photographers and artists to go and speak to school children and, and college students, you know. Last year, I was sent to a high school. I was spoke, speaking to those children. And usually, I speak for 10, 15 minutes. And then I have an interactive se se session with them. So barely after five, six minutes, you know, one of the students, he raised his hand. And I said, yes. So he said, sir, whatever you are saying sounds very interesting. But I can't figure out what exactly are you trying to do to us. So I said, OK, I'll tell you. I'll explain it to you. I said, I have been sent here to do a very important job. I have come here to uproot you and toss you in the air. And then I'll hold you there. Before you land, there are going to be two conditions. A, when you land, you don't step on the steps you've already taken. And B, you will not land on the steps other people have taken. So where do you land? You see, this is precisely the game you need to play with yourself each day, each time. This is my exercise, daily exercise when I go to shoot. So where do you land? But let me tell you, I say nature has such treasures. 
waiting to be explored. But only those who are willing to invest 100% and follow those signals instinctively, they can get it. And they can get it right every time. This is a husband and wife. They were pushing the cart, you know. These are maybe empty boxes. And I kept chasing them and followed them till suddenly, you know, this, they reached this, near this building. And the continuity of the boxes and the structures in the background and the ladies push that energy as if she was running the whole space, you know. So, you know, as you follow and explore, you know, things get aligned in rhythm and in a kind of expression that resonates the richness. This is another picture, you know, you know, I do not mix, I do not double expose, I don't Photoshop. This is two frames, uh, this is a photograph when I was sitting in the car waiting for a friend and through the back view mirror I was seeing this bird on the cot and a little bit of the car and whatever was in front. So I took one shot with giving enough depth of field. You know, sometimes you're sitting in one place, your body is there, but your mind is traveling somewhere else. And if you mix the two images where you are sitting and where your mind is traveling, could be something like this, you know, you will get, you know. But can be more fascinating you know, than the normal. Here also. You know, on Marine Drive in Mumbai, dark clouds were rising, and I love dark clouds and dark skies because they, 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 the earth and the people, they look much brighter than the space, you know. So then everybody lights up, you know. And, but somehow here, you know, you can't see where exactly they are standing as if they are floating on the water and they've lost something and everybody's searching for something. And that search in daily life is so precious, you know. This is a day before Ayodhya, you know, the Babri Masjid was demolished. And here you can see so much of interactive gentleness between people, the, the, the monkey also waiting for something right next to the man and the architecture and the early morning mist, you know. So, you know, these feelings, these emotions, where you can capture the aura of a situation, where you capture the visual strength of all those elements moving together. As it is, photography is about seeing. So when you see something extraordinary coming into your space, that becomes a darshan for me. Darshan is the ability to see things in its entirety. And it's like some, some, sometimes, you know, you go and see somebody, you meet somebody, and that somebody is so much there in mind, body, and soul. And you see them, and you feel, wow, you know. And in our language, we say, darshan ho gaya aapke. We met you. We met you. You know, that feeling. So this is where, you know, I have been watching uh, television here for the last two days. And in fact, you know, wherever you go in the world, you know, if you, if you surf around the channels, within a day or two, you can see the health of the nation, you know, what's happening in this country. And when I'm going to be criticizing here, I promise you how I hate our own television and Hindi cinema and bulk of the programs they show. You know, juvenile, sick they look, you know, and here, in last two days, it's been dead men waking up. Huh? 
taking charge of things, killing people. The vampires are in fashion today. <laughs> and snakes turning out from all sides from a plane and attacking the pilot, attacking so and so. I don't even, you know, you can't figure out what's going on in this world. You know what it shows? It shows bankruptcy of value system. You know, the rape in Bombay and rape in Delhi, this is part of what Hindi cinema is doing to ordinary people. They are getting educated. And this is the education you have here in America. Honestly speaking, you know, the day 9-11 was happening, a friend of mine, journalist friend of mine, he rang me up from Bombay. He just told me, he says, Raghu, go and see, turn on the CNN. So I very quickly turned on the CNN. And what do I see? I see one tower burning. He didn't tell me what was going on. So I see one tower burning. And within two, three minutes, I see another plane coming and hitting the other tower and going into flames, and I say, wow, this Hollywood is really mad. What things they can do? And then, you know, later when they said, you know, this was a terrori terrorist attack, of course, you know, it was mind-boggling and unbelievable what was going on. But really, somewhere, we, we are taking our imagination to those wild ends. And we are really propping up such energies, you know. And they will get reflected on, in our society, the way it's happening in India. We are shameful about that. And last two days, you know, I haven't been able to see one good movie on any of the channels. It's all about these things, you know. As if, you see, I'll, I think I'll take you back to my mother. My mother was, this photograph also I must tell you, you know, I, I'll explain a bit. This is Churchgate Railway Station where morning trains turn up, you know, early morning, local trains. And thousands and thousands of people on both the platforms, you see, coming out and within seconds, the human deluge is gone. It's clean again. And they move so fast because everyone has to get to their jobs, you know. So I was standing there and watching, and then another two trains come, and again that human deluge disappears, you know. So I thought, you know, I have to capture that human deluge. So I gave a time exposure, and these people who were sitting on the benches reading newspapers, they are sharp and they are relaxed. But otherwise, you can feel that human energy and human deluge and the speed at which they move, you know. So the world is, I don't know where it's going. This is one of my very important picture. Yeah. <laughs> and this is actually a dust storm created by the VIP helicopter in the desert. Actually, at that time, Indira Gandhi had gone to Rajasthan in drought-affected areas. And suddenly, she got the news that our then president Zakir Hussain died of a heart attack, and she had to take off from the desert, throwing dust and sand in the eyes of the people. This is how I look at it, you know. You see, South Asia is a very troubled space on this planet. First, we had partition where India was divided into Pakistan and Bangladesh. And then, you know, at that time during partition, I was just five years old. And I don't have much memories, but scary feeling inside me. And I don't remember the details till I went to, you know, this area uh, to Calcutta and the border areas on Bangladesh where thousands of refugees were turning up. And it was, again, my old feelings were coming back to me of insecurity, of hunger, of poverty, you know, how people were rushing, you know. 
Now here, two sons, they are carrying their mother. You know, people turning up on bullock carts. Here, old couple, even their dog has turned up with them. And you look at the expressions and the insecurity and the suffering. This young, beautiful girl was raped. You can see the glazed look in her eyes, you know. And so was this woman. And even look at the boy, how tortured he looks, you know. That human beings, you know, we never learn from the mistakes of the past. As they say, history keeps repeating itself. So some were staying in these pipes because there were not enough shelters, you know. This old woman, you know, her stoned eyes, she didn't have anything to tell, she didn't have anything to ask, you know, because the suffering was so much, you know. This, then the war started, and then this was the shortest war ever fought and won in 19 days, and Pakistan had to surrender with 93,000 soldiers. In the middle is Pakistan's General Niazi, who was in control in Bangladesh, and you can see his expressions, you know, the humiliation, and finally signing the agreement, you know. And Similarly, you know, the story of Pakistan, Afghanistan, and that is an endless story because the terrorism has taken such deep roots and America's participation somehow Actually, it started with Pakistan because way back in 50s, 1950s and 60s, America was looking for a space, or you can say, uh, a base in Pakistan so that it can deal with the two big world powers, Soviet Union and China. And Pakistan, America's policy of appeasing Pakistan at every cost, at every level, started then. And Pakistan's rulers, mainly army rulers, they knew how to earn big money out of America. And this is going on till today. Can you imagine otherwise Osama bin Laden, after 9-11, he's staying in the lap of Pakistan army in Abbottabad. And he's kept there very safely because that's the only way when Americans will keep looking for this biggest terrorist and they can't find him and they will keep shelling out billions of dollars. Until today, Pakistan is playing this game. And the tragedy is that America or India or Afghanistan Everybody is a victim. And within the, the Pakistan itself is the biggest victim today. So the South Asia is not a very happy place, you know. We talk about my mother, Mother Teresa. I went to photograph her way back in 1970, you know, when one of my editor who discovered that here was a very dedicated lady. And when I went there, she was, of course, very compassionate, very loving, but very tough and great discipline. And she was coming down the steps, and you can see the Christ in the background, but the sunshine here, I say sunshine touching the feet of my mother. because. The spirituality, the holiness of mother was unparalleled, you know. And when she went into prayers, it was just look at the intensity in her eye. 
she was always connected and the way her hands you know absolutely you know i have done anything wrong this time i promise you <laughs> you know serving old people you know this is old people zoom in calcutta and she had many followers you know and also people on the road will greet her will need you know mother to give them whatever shelter or help and look at look at her expression her concern you know her sadness in her eyes you know i must tell you this story again if some few people were there yesterday you know first time when i met mother was in 1970 when she was hardly known and uh, i was photographing her for three four days and then she one evening she tells me she says ragura you don't come tomorrow i said why not mother she says because tomorrow is a easter day and i shall be sitting in prayers i don't want any photographers to be roaming around in my space so i was absolutely shocked you know i said oh my god you know what do i do now because mother is not a uh, you know political leader or a celebrity that you can you know get into nudging her and asking her no this way or that way so i looked at mother i said mother you know but there are two things you know you been you say that you value one is that when you serve the people when you serve the people also the fact was she says we are not we are not social workers i am here to serve the people who are suffering because when christ was suffering i wasn't there to serve him so all those who are suffering they are my christ i tell you that's the most beautiful expression i can ever imagine that all those who are suffering are her christ so i said mother when you look after these people who are suffering and that's your seva and that's the compassion and the work you do which i have been photographing for the last 3 4 days i said the second thing you say you know after days work you sit in prayer to rejuvenate yourself because the lord must and rich you with more energy and more power she says yes i said mother i have done half of the story photographing you with the people but you know i said i don't know that guy who that guy is i don't know how he looks but when you sit in prayer and you close your eyes he comes and lands in your eyes and that's the time when i want to photograph you so mother was something so amazing you know that if she found you there that you are very serious and committed so she says all right you come tomorrow but with one condition that you will not move from one place you know and you will not walk around i said yes mother so i next morning i reach there at 6 in the morning she says oh very good you come come in with me so we walk into the chapel there are hundreds of sisters sitting there's a priest over there with the statue of the christ and mother walks in and she makes me sit right next to her and she sits next to the wall here so i sit down you know and gradually mother goes into prayer and her expression her everything changes so i had made this commitment that i shall not move from one place so i am debating and i am uneasy what to do with myself you know getting upset with myself so eventually i get up come right in front take a few pictures go back and after about half an hour 45 minutes of prayers the sisters of course i was shooting the sisters also and everybody standing there you know and finally you know the sisters the prayers got over and they were going and kissing the feet of the christ and coming out so now it was mother's turn to get up and go which was about 25 feet away from where we were sitting so mother gets up and again i am breathless i say oh god you know what do i do so mother starts walking and very 
slowly I also follow her and I take the pictures. Mother comes back from the other door and I come out from the same door and then I had to face mother. So I said, mother, forgive me, I couldn't keep my promise. So she came, she held my hands and she looked into my eyes, into my heart because she was very scary, you know, because she would look straight into your heart and find out who you were. It, it was a very dangerous experience for people like us who've been naughty boys all their lives, you know. <laughs> so she held my hands. She says, oh, God has given you this assignment. You must do it well. So there I was forgiven and blessed. And with mother, I mean, Albanian young lady comes to India to head a convent school in Calcutta. She sees poverty and misery. She says, what the hell am I doing here? And she leaves the job and starts serving the people. And she becomes our mother. And I remember another incident, you know, where a Swiss businessman comes and mother was serving some of the old people in old people's home. I was taking pictures. A sister comes and says, mother, there's a Swiss businessman and uh, he wants to see you. So mother says, okay, tell him to wait. So when she finished doing that, she goes, and this man, you know, ha the way he talked to her, you know, it gave the impression that he was very rich and he had tons of money. And he can, you know, possibly donate some amount to you, mother. But the feeling was not very gentle. So mother listened to him and very politely tells him, listen, in my own country, my people give me enough money for my poor. Why don't you open a home in your own country? I tell you, she did me so proud. I, th I thought she was a greater Indian than many other Indians here. So these are the kind of experiences, you know, we've had. And also a man like His Holiness, the Dalai Lama, had to come to India to be with us, you know. So Indians, that way we are very blessed people, you know, somehow. <laughs> This is, you know, on the left-hand side, looks like mother, but it's not mother. This is after she had gone. This is a statue of mother. And this is the kind of posture, the way she used to sit. And this is the spot where she used to sit. And those are the sisters praying, you know. So these, this was my last picture in the book that I did on her. Another great lady from India of another kind, Mrs. Indira Gandhi who was the longest prime minister, maybe I think 18 years or something like that. She was a very tough lady. Sitting with her own, own congressman, if you look at her expressions, she is somewhere else planning something else, you know. And she was unpredictable and nobody could. These are senior congressmen waiting for her to sign some important ordinance. This is, well, it reflects the kind of psychophancy that goes on in our political parties in India, you know. And she said, you know, she loved the Himalayas. So when she was in Simla during the Simla agreement with uh, Zulfkar Ali Bhutto, so I sent sent in a request saying that you say you love the Himalayas, so won't it be nice if you give me some time? And then where she was staying, you know, there was this parapet wall which was coming in the way, so I couldn't get her full body. So I said, Miss Gandhi would be nice, you know, if you can climb the parapet wall, <laughs> which she did, you know. <laughs> I have, you know, actually when I was young, I wanted to become a musician. And my father was against it because we have a very derogatory term for 
people who sing and dance, the entertainers, you know, Mirasis, you know. And so he said, none of that, you know, you can do. But then I loved the music so much, and this is one of our South Indian Karnatic musician, S. Balchandra. And his strokes used to be so deep and heavy. As, and this is in Mahabalipuram, where that there's a big rock, you know, sitting on, you know, another uh, rock. So I thought, you know, this was also this dome and the domes of his veena, they, they resonate, you know, the same experience. This is our great Bismillah Khan, who's no more. But how sculptural his head is. And in such a meditative spirit, you know, that, you know, when you pray, when you sing, if you don't listen to what you sing and how you sing and how you pray, then even he's not going to listen to you. This is great Ali Akbar Khan Sahab. He has a school in LA, you know, and he was given MacArthur Foundation grants and all kinds of recognitions. But just see the intensity in their faces and their eyes, you know. Vilayat Khan Sahib, another sitar maestro. Now this is the color work. <laughs> You know, earlier I was keeping things in proper perspective, keeping a distance from the subject matter. But then I realized sometimes some elements turn up right in front, you know, up front, you know, in, you know where you, you wonder why the hell this dog is here. And I said, what the hell, you know, why not, you know. So I started photographing like this, you know, <laughs> which creates another kind of perspective and alignment, you know, because what was going on in the background and this man is fast asleep, also is something so unique of India, you know. This is the Mahakumbh, recent Mahakumbh, which, is, which was the largest human gathering on the planet ever took place. See the energy and the charge in these men have. You know, they are going through the rituals. The misty morning at the Mahakumbh, and then into the Sangam and Ganga. So we are back again. But, you know, there are a few things, you know, which I like to talk about. That, you know, they say a good picture is worth a thousand words. A thousand words can be a lot of noise. How about some silence? A moment in space that you capture, which is non-negotiable and which restores silence in you. For me, the biggest, greatest movie or great piece of writing or music will be the one not which raises question, but restores silence in you. And there is a very beautiful story about Buddha when he got his enlight enlightenment and people started inviting him to various villages and towns and places. So, you know, he was to arrive at a small town and talk to people and he got delayed. Now, this energy, if you've ever felt, you know, silence traveling, if you've seen it travel, is something very unique that Buddha was to arrive and he got delayed. And then what happens, you know, when the crowds gather, you know, they start talking among themselves, you know. So the talking was going on and everything. And then suddenly Buddha arrives and there was a little platform. He goes up on the platform. Somebody offers him a rose and he stands there. But everybody's busy talking. And those were the years when there were no mics and no loudspeaker. So gradually when people start noticing him, the silence starts traveling. Everybody is becoming quiet. And the silence travels till the end. And then everybody is silent. 
and Buddha is standing with the rose and looking at them. And everybody is waiting in silence, and there is complete silence. So he sits down, he closes his eyes, and people also, they are in silence, they close their eyes. And he sits there for a few minutes, then he gets up, does this, leave the rose there, and walks away. So this is a story of silence. Because the purpose of a great guru, the purpose of a great piece of work is to restore silence because there's so much noise. There are so many stories. There are so, so much of madness going on in this world. And those who can restore silence, that's where the ma magic lies. And another example, you know, when we talk about creativity in photography, for me, people say, you know, sometimes they say, you know, your work, some of your pictures look like paintings. I say, yeah. Too bad. Some people say, you know, we can recognize your pictures. I say, oh God, that's terrible. Because, you know, the work of art, and especially in photography, it's very precious. In fact, you know, I'll say that, you know, the way Khalil Gibran talks about children, that these children, they are not your children or my children. They are the life's longing for itself. Isn't that beautiful? So I like my images to reflect the life's longing for themselves, for itself, and not have my stamp on it, you know. And not, not to be equated with paintings, you know. So that when I give it back to life, the moment that I have frozen, and when I give it back to life, life starts moving again without any jerk. This is the purest way of being creative. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much for a wonderful tour and lots of introspection. Um, I think it might be best if we just open it up and moderate a conversation. Yeah, if anybody has any um, questions. There are, some, there are mics on either side, so if you could, uh, uh, anybody who wants to start us off can, can, uh, can come up and maybe just introduce yourself briefly and pose a question if you wish. Anyone like to start? Uh, I'm Mukti Khaire. And I'm, I teach at the, at the business school. My question for you actually came out of um, something that you mentioned today. So when you talked about your pictures uh, of Mother Teresa, it was clear you had a lot of love and respect uh, for the subject. When you talk about most of your pictures, it is clear you have a lot of love and respect for even the anonymous subjects there. And yet, when you looked at, when you showed us a picture of the politicians and you talked about the culture of psychophancy, that how do you manage to take pictures in, a, in the, and this is broadly in the Indian context, where there is so much to also dislike about the subject and still take a, a picture that would actually you would be proud of? You know, the process of creativity is not to fall in love and begin to hate somebody. You know, you have to stand as an honest witness to what's going on. Actually, you know, when I was with India Today as a picture editor in our editorial meetings also, you know, sometimes, you know, when... Uh, you know, you don't like some politician, and one of the editors says, you know, I think, you know, especially I'll give you an example when Rajiv Gandhi became the prime minister. And there was one, one of our editors who's very well known. I won't take his name. And he said, well, you know, after all, he's Mrs. Gandhi's son. What can he do? I'm going to write a piece about him. So I said, listen, this is very unfair. 
he could be a son of so and so but he's an individual first and we must have the honesty to look at the world as it reveals itself right now to us and we don't need to carry this kind of bias against anybody and then go do a story which means we are not being honest journalist you know it is very essential that our heart should be clean and transparent and ready to reflect whatever it gets to see or experience so that you don't have an agenda you don't have a game to play so that your works your writing your photography can live the test of the time you know and you are not doing it for or against anybody you know does that explain the can you can you give a sense of uh, some of these images are so beautiful but you also said that in the beginning of your talk that you have no magic finger even after 50 years of photography how much time does it take can you give a sense of the uh, the labor of love you see <laughs> it is very surprising that sometimes you walk into a situation and it's ready to reveal itself here i am and there are other moments when you are exploring and going up and down and nothing is happening so you know it's unpredictable you know and that's the magic of being a creative person that you make yourself available and see what comes your way so you ca you can't can't decide anything you know yeah hi sir nice to see you again today uh, uh, uh hi i'm anshuman i'm from new delhi and i've been a huge fan of yours for like lot of time uh, read all your interviews and been following you for a lot of time uh so my question is you have worked with like the most important people of india you know who have been worshiped in a way musicians like ravi shankar sportsmen politicians mother teresa everybody so i'd like to know from you like were you able to find some common personality traits between you know these individuals which you could see you know something common between those yes. people you know yes yes for sure yeah the fact is that each one of them is a human being of some kind <laughs> please remember that and that is the most essential element of life that they are one of us and you have to look at them very objectively no matter who they are good bad or indifferent you know. mm. yeah the lady is back yeah yeah go ahead I'm sorry yeah. Yeah. hi um thank you very much for showing us your beautiful work um the question that i have for you today is that um I mean today the age that we live in I think it's very important for us to not look at art as something that's a thing in itself but rather uh, to understand how it becomes part of a social and political nexus especially as far as the image is concerned I mean we all understand that it carries a very strong power of suggestion and even though a photograph may be taken with the best of interests and inten intentions at times um part of the job of the photographer i sometimes feel given recent events in american media as well and syria the syrian conflict um photographers sometimes need to um somehow protect their work from uh the let's say practices of propaganda because photography in a way lends itself to framing subjects and and there's a very strong tradition of subject object relationships that are formed much in the way that cartography is also vulnerable to such a interplay in some ways um there is a strong also danger of aestheticizing the sufferings of subjects as well and so i my question is how what is the ethical stance of a photographer and, and how do you think a photographer should sort of approach this dilemma of of you know aestheticizing suffering or propagating a certain idea 
um, you know, to, to mediate the image or to represent it a certain way, to make you see things in a way that are not necessarily neutral. Um, you know, I think I have already explained it slightly differently. The fact that you be the clean, like a television screen, and you reflect the image which is honest and clean and clear, without any style, without any sense of aesthetics, without any composition. As I said, it should reflect the life's longing for itself. If that is the purity you have in your approach, you know, it will live beyond propaganda. It will live beyond any aesthetics for itself. So that purity of approach is so essential. That's why I say all these styles and trends and aesthetics don't mean anything in today's photography. You know, there was a period, you know, when aesthetics were important, sense of composition was important. Not anymore. Things have changed very drastically, you know. Thank you. So I'm Shugato Bose. I teach here in the history department. And uh, your photographs uh, of uh, the Bangladesh crisis actually took me back to 1971. And uh, I used to go uh, practically every Sunday to the Bonga border to the refugee camps with my father, who was a pediatrician. And, uh, you know, I had never seen such human misery before in my life. I was a high school student and possibly haven't seen such human suffering sort of since at such close quarters. And uh, you, you captured that uh, kind of uh, suffering in the faces of your uh, subjects in the, uh, you know, in the border areas, in the refugee camps, and those pipes in which human beings had to find shelter are unforgettable, you know, yeah. they are inde indelible in my memory, but you have, you know, really captured them in your images. Uh, I wanted to ask you about the, the later photographs. Uh, you know, uh, how did you travel to Dhaka uh, to, you know, to photograph the, the surrender? surrender? Did you, yeah. Were you traveling with the army or did you fly into Dhaka at that point? And it seemed to me that I mean, what, uh, did you go to, um, to, to photograph the event uh, at that time? Because uh, it seemed to me that you were more interested in the expressions on the people's faces, and that's what you sort of related to us. Yeah. And again, in 1972, uh, you went to Simla, and there was a very major political event taking place. The talks between Indira Gandhi and Zulfikar Ali Bhutto, and the Simla agreement was going to be signed. But you seem to be less interested in the event. What you showed us was the silhouette of Indira Gandhi against <laughs> the, the Himalayan range. Uh, so I just wanted to ask you, I mean, uh, perhaps tell us a little bit about the context uh, in which you went to uh, Bangladesh on the 16th of December of uh, 1971. But also, is the event totally unimportant to you? Is it the people? Is it the human beings? Is it the faces? Is it the expression? You see, actually, I have also shown photographs of great masters, the musicians whom I, you know, I've enjoyed listening to and being with them, and, you know, Mother Teresa and Indira Gandhi. But let me tell you, bulk of my work is about ordinary people and their daily lives, you know. And most of my books, they are full of the ordinary people and their daily lives, you know. And here also I have brought out a book on the, uh, Bangladesh. It's called The Price of Freedom. And 80% of the book is about the refugees coming in and their miseries and how they were, you know, getting into the shelters, their food, their everything else, and what was going on in their, you know, feelings inside in their inner world, you know. Plus, uh, also I went in with the Mukti Bahini, you know, when they were fighting the Pakistani army, you know, with those old outdated rifles and everything. And I, at one point, I got stuck between the crossfire between the Pakistan army and the Mukti Bahini also. But as far as the surrender was concerned, you know, because uh, General Jacob, who was commanding the armies there, he actually, he gave us this story when a 
finally I was editing my book, I went to him. He says, you know, we were just 3,000 soldiers we, and Pakistan army was surrendering, leaving areas, running away. Actually, they were abandoning areas and running away towards Dhaka. So we decided, you know, since they are on the run, so let me send a message to General Niazi that I want to come and see you. So he says, you know, I got a signal that, yes, you can come and see me. So he says, I went there and Pakistani's army, they were 93,000 soldiers. And he says, I had barely 3,000. And by the way, he, he's a Jew. And they hated the idea of surrendering to a Jew, you know. And so he went and met General Niazi. And he told him that, listen, we've surrounded you. And we can't guarantee your security unless you surrender. And he planned it in such a strategic way that the general got scared. He says, listen, you know, if you decide to surrender today or tomorrow, we'll take care of your family, of your, of your officers and your soldiers, and we'll treat you with respect. But if you don't, then I walk away. And he says, I was so scared that if he kills me right there, that we are just 3,000 of us. And then the surrender was organized very suddenly. So we in the newspapers, we got the news that the surrender is happening tomorrow. So army was organizing helicopters for some of the press people, those who want to go in. So I flew in with the army helicopter and photographed the surrender and the victory scenes and things like that. So that was, in any case, very essential and important part to end the story. You know. I'm just interested in the pictures that you're taking of ordinary people. Now, the pictures that you've been taking of uh, in the 90s and, and the 2000s, have, do you find that the picture that you t take show like a different optimism or a different ter time of you know, upbeatness than the pictures that you were taking of ordinary people from before that time? I show, sorry, I... Do the pictures that you've been taking of ordinary the young people. generation of uh, the 1990s, the 2000, do you feel like those pictures that you're capturing a different type of uh, dynamism? I haven't understood. Has, has the mood changed? So the, peop the pictures that you took of ordinary people, Purane Zaman, in the old and times, today. and today, have the new pictures? Do they no, let me tell you, you know, somehow India manages to live with its own strength and energy, no matter how poor they are. And, and actually, you know, one of our magnum photographers, you know, he has been coming to India and he says, Raghu, you don't take pictures of poverty in your country. I said, don't be silly. You know, I have taken pictures of most ordinary people and living in most ordinary situations. But, you know, when I started photographing mother's work in 1970, and I was a young man trying to learn many things from somebody like mother, she says, listen to me. Remember one thing, that whatever you photograph, the dignity of every individual has to be maintained. And very strict she was. So this is what I learned from her, that even when I photograph poor people and ordinary people in the streets, on the footpath, the dignity. And that, is, that gives you the sense of being upbeat and being there in whatever circumstances. It doesn't matter, you know. So people, you know, there are some photographers who are very important photographers and that great work. They've come to India and photographed poverty and gone back. And that is just one-tenth of the truth of India. Yes, sir. Hey, thank you. I'm, I'm David Bloom from the School of Public Health. Um, I was hoping you could tell us something about your early professional development. Uh, I imagine you had some gurus who was your favorite. What was the experience like? Um, I would also guess you have students. Um, what kind of experience do you try to provide for them? Well, you know, uh, we, we've also started a center for photography in Delhi. It's been almost a year. But apart from that, you know, there are young people 
who come to meet, see, see me and meet me and show their work. There are two things, you know, I have become over the years that A, at this point of time, I don't have that kind of time to waste with anybody and everybody. So I choose very carefully. I meet people and if I see that spark and passion in somebody who's mad about it, I say, come in. And I see some people who are just having fun with photography, I say, go somewhere else. You know, it's very serious for me. I, I can't waste my precious time on frivolous things. So when I find any youngster who's passionate about it and so committed and so much there, sure. And I don't believe in any secrets. And so that, because you know, when I was growing up, for years, you know, I didn't have anybody to tell me, you know, where to go. And today, that's where we can make a difference to our younger generation that don't waste hundreds of years looking for your direction. And also, something very important which I have learned, you know, some, some young photographers come and tell me, oh, we consider you to be our guru. I said, the choice is entirely yours. <laughs> you know, because, why? Because I feel honestly, that in each one of us, we have our own guru sitting inside, you know. And that guy, you know, when you, after day's work, when you put your head on the, on the pillow and you want to go to sleep, that guy comes in. He says, he talks to you about the day you've spent and he discusses the whole day with you. And we want to live in a comfort zone and we say, oh, well, I have worked hard, I have done this picture, but that guy tells you, you know, what you captured is this much. The experience was so large. So the guy is sitting there and telling the, the other guy in you. And if you keep listening to him, there is no end. And in any case, you know, we have this Guru Shishya Parampara, which is supposed to be a big deal. But let me tell you, I think the best Guru will be somebody, not the one who can give you what he has. Well, because what he has is already done and over. He should have the ability to understand you, to smell you, and to know you, what could be your direction, and then gradually push you into doing your own kind of journey in your direction, and not giving what I have. That is over. Yes, ma'am. Um, I'll get a mic to you. Could you pass the mic at the back, please? Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for this extraordinary experience. Um, I want to ask you something. I perceive you as a kind of mystic of photography. <laughs> Are you? A mystic of photography. I want to go in that direction. You see, when we discuss things, you know, we, we, you know, each individual, you know, you filter out the best that you think it should be the one for you to be sharing with people. Not that this is what I am, I wish I was, <laughs> you know. But you, you try to aim to those heights, you know, where, you know, it's another world, another, you know, Okay, so the second part is, <laughs> um, does your Hindu uh, background, in lieu of a better word, uh, contribute it in one way or another to this kind of world? Gives you continuity. Continuity hmm. and uh, this kind of worldview that you have, and this perception of, of what a human being is. You know, uh, I am uh, associated with Magnum Photos, which is world's most prestigious photo agency, and we have got some of the top photographers in this agency, and these individuals are highly creative and mad people, you know, and very competitive, 
and very competent and wonderful people. But me, you know, I live in India, I work only in India. I am not the kind who's flirted, flirting around and shooting anywhere and everywhere in the world. A, because basically I'm a shy person. B, also I feel, you know, being born in India, you know, I can even close my eyes and smell the place and walk around and get myself energized with those kind of feelings. So I don't flirt around everywhere. And as far as my background is concerned, you know, I doubt it if I have any background of Hinduism. You know, I have very strange feeling about Hinduism. Hinduism, you know, we were ruled by the Mughals for more than two centuries, and then by British another century or so. And in the, the Hindu India accepted the Muslims also, they accepted the Christians also, and they were not great fighters, you know. And they accepted everything somehow, but what they were good at was they were great thinkers. Yes. And they imbibed, they learned so much from Islam, and they learned so much from Christianity. So the Christianity in India also got a kind of, even Islam in India was far more gentler than uh, Pakistan onward, you know. And the effect of Hinduism and Buddhism on Southeast Asia was far more gentler on Islam also. It's now in last 10 years that even those Muslim countries, because of the fundamentalism coming from the other part of the world, has become very different. Otherwise, you know, also, but the fact is that that, that Hinduism somehow I can't relate to, you know, the kind of Hinduism that has gone on. And we say we are so great, you know, Hinduism is a way of life, bullshit. Nobody allowed you to practice it, you know. <laughs> oh, thank on that, you very uh, much. On that encompassing and colloquial note. <laughs> uh, please join me in thanking Mr. Rai for taking some time. Thank you very much. <laughs>